Welcome to the first lecture of this course, History and Systems of Psychology. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to answer these questions. What are systems? Why do we study the history of psychology? How do scholars study history? What are presentism and historicism? What are internal and external histories? And what are personalistic and naturalistic histories? In the first part of this lecture, we are going to explore the meaning of the word systems. Psychology and other fields of study, like biology and history, are systems of thought. A system is a framework or organized set of ideas, theories, models, or approaches. The various components of a system work together to make it function, and a single change to one part of the system can change the whole system. Here are some examples. The family unit is a system of people and their relationships and interactions with one another. Governments are systems of representatives, rules, and procedures. And interstates are physical systems of roads, ramps, and signs. It's important for us to recognize that a system is influenced by the context within which it exists. Historians of psychology must consider the cultural, social, economic, political, and intellectual context in which significant contributions and events occur. Thus, psychology is a product of the different systems that existed at various times in history. For example, the belief systems of ancient philosophers and early physiologists impacted the field's development. This figure depicts psychology as a system. As you can see here, the field's history is just one part of the system. It also includes the goals of psychology, to describe, explain, predict, and control, as well as the concepts that fit within it, human behavior, and mental processes. We could add the subfields or subsystems of psychology to this illustration. In the next part of this lecture, we'll answer the question, why do we study the history of psychology? The field's development is a fascinating story. In 1908, Hermann Ebbinghaus, a pioneer in the study of memory, wrote that the field has a long past but short history. That's because psychology evolved from the writings of ancient Greek philosophers and early physiologists in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, but the field is only about 150 years old. Experts generally agree that the field was officially established in 1879 when Wilhelm Wundt created the first experimental psychology laboratory in Germany. As you will learn in these lectures, only by studying the writings of early contributors were they able to make sense of psychology's emergence as a distinct field of scientific study. The most obvious reason for studying psychology's history is to better understand the field itself. We know that history provides context and helps explain how and why things happened. Historians also argue that the past is essential to the future. They say an understanding of the past can help us learn from our mistakes and make better decisions moving forward. In addition, recognizing how psychologists were influenced by their environment can help us understand their ideas and why they believed what they believed. An understanding of the past can also help us appreciate the present. It provides a yardstick against which our progress can be measured. Finally, psychology's history is said to unite the various subfields of psychology around a common set of goals and values. For instance, since the 1800s, psychologists have been fighting to uphold both the scientific and applied aspects of the field. This is why many of the field's graduate programs rely on the scientist-practitioner model in training aspiring psychologists. The model has been around for a long time. Let's look at this quote from one of psychology's most prominent historians, Edwin G. Boring. He summarized this view of history in 1929, and it still holds true for many scholars today. Quote, The experimental psychologist needs historical sophistication within his own sphere of expertness. Without such knowledge, he sees the present in distorted perspective. He mistakes old facts and old views for new, and he remains unable to evaluate the significance of new movements and methods a psychological sophistication that contains no component of historical orientation seems to me to be no sophistication at all. End quote. Here's another quote from Michael Crichton, American author and creator of the Jurassic Park series. He wrote, If you don't know history, then you don't know anything. You're a leaf that doesn't know it's part of a tree. Before we look at some of the limitations of studying history, take a moment to consider whether you agree with Boring and Crichton, and why or why not. Experts also recognize that the study of history is imperfect. They'd argue that the past is too different from the present to be relevant to modern times. Because the contexts are different, what we learn from the past doesn't help us address today's problems. G. W. F. Hegel, a German philosopher, 
made this point when he wrote, The only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. Other experts point to the biases inherent in the study of history as reasons to be skeptical of its relevance. In 1881, Wendell Phillips, an American attorney and abolitionist, wrote, History is a series of lies, agreed upon. This quote highlights the dynamic nature of history. That is, our understanding of the past changes as we gain access to new artifacts and evidence. It can also change based on who is doing the interpreting, how they were educated and trained, their motives, and so on. Now let's consider, how do scholars study history? Historiography refers to the techniques, principles, and issues involved in the study of history. Historio means past, and graphi means writings. Historians use a variety of methods to study the past, and we'll take a look at some examples in this section. Many of psychology's earliest contributors published their work in books, magazines, and journals, wrote extensively in their personal journals, and exchanged written letters with other experts. By studying these historical writings, scholars gather a great deal of information about the development of psychology over time. Let's differentiate between the types of writings or sources studied by historians. Primary sources are first-hand accounts of history. This information was written by the person of interest, and it was created during the event or era being studied. Examples of primary sources include autobiographies, letters between two or more people, research notes, diary entries, and speeches. If we are interested in learning about Sigmund Freud, his letters to Carl Jung and Alfred Adler are a primary source of information. Secondary sources are secondhand accounts of history written by someone other than the person of interest, and it was created after the event or era has passed. Examples of secondary sources include biographies, journal articles, magazine articles, books, and interview notes. If we are interested in learning about Freud, Letters written by Young and Adler qualify as secondary sources. It's important for us to keep in mind that there are limitations to the study of history. First, the reliability and validity of historical information is sometimes questionable. That is, some evidence is biased. For instance, Carl Jung's autobiography was written by one of his assistants, and the goal was to show him a more positive light. Also, some evidence is missing or incomplete. Some of the earliest contributors destroyed their work before it could be shared with others. For example, John B. Watson, the father of behaviorism, burned his research notes, manuscripts, and letters to other psychologists before he died. Our understanding of Hermann Ebbinghaus and Gustav Fechner changed once we gained access to their personal diaries and papers, decades after their deaths. And we still don't have all of Charles Darwin's and Sigmund Freud's personal papers. A second limitation is that scholars shape the histories they write. Their understanding of past events is based on the information available to them and their perspective. Their personal biases, perceptual biases, and attributional errors impact their ideas and their articulation of those ideas. An example of this is Edwin G. Boring's version of history was filtered through his mentor, Edward B. Titchener, the father of structuralism. Titchener preferred experimental psychology over applied psychology, and he influenced Boring to basically ignore the contributions of the latter in his famous history book. Another example is that one of Sigmund Freud's biographers downplayed the extent of his cocaine use to help protect his reputation. Keep in mind, too, that different historians may interpret the same historical event or contribution differently. Some are more accurate than others, but it can be challenging for everyday people to know which historians do their homework. Fortunately, historians recognize the limitations of their methods and do their best to overcome them. As they find new sources and gather more information, their initial understanding of an event may evolve, slightly or drastically. So what you learn in these lectures could change by the time the next generation takes this class in 25 years. When scholars study the past, they try to use what is called a new history approach, which involves three concepts, historicism, external histories, and naturalistic histories. You'll learn about each of these concepts in the next parts of this lecture. What are presentism and historicism? Each of these concepts is a perspective or a way of thinking about history. Presentism is interpreting the past in terms of the present. It means we view the past through a modern lens, using our current perspective and knowledge about the world. We'll take a look at an example in just a minute. Historicism is a different approach. It considers the context within which historical events occur. This context is called the zeitgeist, the climate, or spirit of the times. 
You'll see this word many times in these lectures. It comes from the German words Zeit, which means time, and Geist, which means spirit or ghost. Historicism requires perspective-taking, a conscious effort to place oneself in the situation or time period of interest. In the history of psychology, for example, contextual factors like economic opportunities, wars, and discrimination played a big role in its development. Both world wars influenced the growth of personnel selection, psychological testing, and engineering psychology. Meaning United States government shaped the actions of applied psychologists at the time. Now let's look at another example and interpret it from both perspectives. In 1861, Paul Broca, who identified Broca's area in the brain, wrote that men were intellectually superior to women because women's brains were smaller. A historian who approaches this information from a presentist approach might label Broca a sexist or a fraud, because they use modern standards to judge others. On the other hand, a historian who approaches this example from a historicist approach would refrain from using these terms to describe his actions. Instead, they would present all of the information, including an explanation that his views were consistent with the stereotypical beliefs of the time. In the late 1800s, scientists had discovered that men's and women's brains were significantly different in terms of size and weight. Combined with the lack of women in higher education, they concluded, incorrectly, men must be smarter than women. Of course, they failed to recognize that women had been banned from universities up until the mid-1800s. Taking on a historicist approach means presenting all of this information. It does not mean condoning or supporting the people, events, and ideas they study. To summarize, presentism reflects your current opinion, while historicism recognizes the majority opinion of the people and time period of interest. It's a matter of understanding the similarities and differences between how do we think today and how did most people think at that time. What are internal and external histories? To learn about a person or event, historians collect both internal and external histories. An internal history is directly relevant to the history of a specific person, event, or idea. For example, we could trace the development of a single theory over time. An external history focuses on factors that are indirectly relevant to the topic of interest. This method gathers information about the broader context, including the social, cultural, political, economic, and intellectual factors that influence the topic of interest. To understand why a theory developed the way it did, we would explore the zeitgeist, or the spirit of the times. Later in this lecture series, for instance, you'll learn how the early theories of intelligence were shaped by eugenics and the belief that intelligence is determined at birth by one's genes. Here is an example of an external history of the late 1900s. Between 1980 and 2020, at least four external forces contributed to the evolution of psychology and the zeitgeist of the times. A strong national identity as a superpower in the world, advances in technology like the internet and cell phones, an increase in diversity of people and ideas, and an increased concern with environmental issues. Note once again that historians examine both the topic of interest as well as the external factors that influenced it. What are personalistic and naturalistic histories? A personalistic history focuses on an individual historical figure, their life, their actions, and their contributions to the world. In our case, their contributions to psychology. For instance, a biography about Francis Sunner would qualify as a personalistic history. It includes information about his childhood, his family, his education, his experience in World War I, his training in psychology, his research, and so on. Interestingly, personalistic histories align with Western cultures and their interest in heroes and villains, and personal recognition. But people are not the only forces of change. A naturalistic history examines the broader forces of history, the naturally occurring events that played a significant role in shaping the past. For example, Edwin Boring pointed to the occurrence of multiples, or multiple independent events, which are said it happened when two or more people independently create the same theory or make the same discovery. Through a naturalistic approach, historians learned that the world-famous Charles Darwin and the relatively unknown Alfred Wallace, simultaneously yet independently, developed nearly the same theory of evolution in the mid-1800s. Eventually, Wallace sent a letter to Darwin, describing his ideas. Upon reading the letter, Darwin realized he had competition and worked quickly to publish the book he had been working on for nearly 20 years before Wallace got credit for the theory. As you can see from this first lecture, 
psychology's history is fascinating and valuable to our understanding of the field. In the next lecture, you'll learn more about the influence of ancient philosophy and the physiologists of the Renaissance and Enlightenment periods.